Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 29 of the Living the Dream video podcast. I'm Rishi Barron with the Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting. This podcast celebrating the great success stories that we've had throughout our pro program and a guy who I've wanted to have on this for a long time and what better way to do it than to start the new year. Alfonso McCree Jr. He has had a lot of jobs already in the industry, so I'm not going to list them all right now, but among them, he has started what's been a very successful show, a uh, podcast on his YouTube channel, Alfonso Speaks True Crime and Conversation. He is also a ring announcer for Karate Combat, going around the country, around the world, really, working on that. Alfonso, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight. Pleasure's all mine. You know, I've wanted to be on this thing since I saw the first episode, so let's go. Well, if you have deserved the honor more with all the work that you've been doing, and I got to also celebrate the background that you have, I'd say that's one of the yes. more colorful backgrounds. You want to explain what's on your wall behind you? Sure, I will. Uh, so behind me here, we have a few things. We have the classic Attitude Era WWF Championship belt. Cost me about $400. This one over here cost me about $250. It's the uh, classic WCW with the NWO spray paint on it. Um, this is the uh, sponsor of Alfonso Speaks, Hibernation, Kenichi Bear, Hibernation 5C headphones, the same ones I have on my head right now. Um, this is a bobblehead of the future of the Washington National, C.J. Abrams. I'm really excited for us to get back to relevancy. Of course, I always have to show Maryland some love. Um, it's my home state. Grew up in PG County, right outside Washington, D.C. Uh, this one right here is a love letter my wife wrote me. Uh, a few months ago so i always keep that with me um you know just for inspiration over here uh my good vibes only sign very important very important but if i turn the actual light on the glare is just <laughs> absolutely atrocious so i just keep it off but people love it people read it and this was a uh a gift from my dear friend devon dudley wwe hall of famer he got me that for christmas a few weeks ago and uh you know i told him like that's going up on my wall immediately i love cats i have two of them uh sammy and luna they're awesome i'm a cat dad and then finally we have a uh, a poster of the late nipsey hustle that is my inspiration that's who actually uh got me started on this like big path towards like success and my aspirations and all of these different things that i wanted to do um listen to his album victory lap and this is a picture of him uh in a music video from one of the songs on that uh that album and uh you know when i listened to that album it completely changed my life and that's how i am where i am like right now so and it's great to see you connect with so many things that have made you the man that you are we talk about finding your voice you've got it right behind you you've got it within you you wear it on your sleeve and it's led you to great success but where did the dream start for you that's led you on the path that you're on today uh so of course i was a big sports fan like my entire life but like as far as using my voice I've been public speaking since I was in elementary you know I was doing like honor roll assemblies and things of that nature so like I was never really afraid of speaking in front of people and I kind of figured out like I have a talent for this stuff and then you fast forward to 2012 I graduated high school I started my kind of started my career at Prince George's Community College uh, just calling basketball games, just trying to find my footing, had, you know, a few people supporting me through that process, but of course, ran out of money, had to make a decision, which led me into the military. And those six years really kind of changed my life, made me a better person. And when I got out, I was able to use the GI Bill and come down to full sail, graduate from Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting, and the rest is history. You made the most out of that GI Bill because you got every ounce out of our program during your time with us. Obviously, I'm I'm really excited to talk all things uh, PG County in Maryland as a University of Maryland grad. It's a little <laughs> different sports scene there. I think it's it's got a unique flavor than maybe other places in the country. What was life like growing up in the D.C. area with all the colorful sports figures around there? Well, it's... <sighs> It's, it's it's super complicated because when you talk about like our pro teams in DC, um, you know, the, the fan bases around DC, you know, they call, they call it the United States a melting pot. Well, the DMV is a melting pot of fans. So like there, 
you know, you, you can go to a place like Green Bay, Wisconsin, and you're going to find Packers fans and Packers fans only there, right? You can go to a place like, I don't know, San Francisco, you know, the Bay, and you're going to find 49ers or Raiders fans. That's it. You know what I mean? When it comes to D.C., it's like so many different people move there that the fan bases are just so broad. Like you can go to a commander's game and expect half the stadium to be full of the other team's fans. And it doesn't really matter who's coming into play. It, it It's realistic for that to happen for, for everyone. But then, you know, you look at like our actual sports heroes, you know, you look at people like Sugar Ray Leonard that came out of the city, you know, you look at people like, a Michael Beasley, who maybe should have had a better NBA career, but people will tell you stories about him at heat practice, giving LeBron James the work on the court. You know, you have people like Kevin Durant, obviously, who grew up right down the street from me, who's won two championships, brought those championships home, you know, and paraded them around the community to show the kids like, hey, you could do this too. So like, you know, we, we do have a rich history and I've always looked up to that history, right? And I've always wanted to be somebody who's thought of when you think of DMV legends and people who have made like a big impact and done big things, that's always been kind of a big motivator for me. So I guess like, even though I'm in a different world, technically I'm in media, not necessarily on the playing field and still take a lot of inspiration from them since I was little, you know, growing up, people like Sean Taylor, obviously, who still remember to this day, you know, I think it's, it's been like 16 years, you know, since his, you know, unfortunate passing. And you can still go anywhere in DC and find 21 spray painted somewhere. You know, you can still see Sean Taylor jersey. That, that's legendary. You know, that means you made some type of impact. I looked at people like that, looked at people that did things like that on the playing field. And I was like, how can I do that in my own arena? And uh, that's what I'm working on now. I didn't get to know you until you were married with a kid after going through six years in the Air Force. What was the young Alfonso like? unsure of himself um trying to figure out who I was as a person uh what my belief systems were what I really wanted to do with my life and trying to figure out how to live for myself instead of living for everybody else and I think like I had to really redefine what was realistic to me you know like growing up most people will see the people that the grown-ups around them right working jobs that they don't like they'll come home they'll complain about their jobs and stuff and you know because work sucks sometimes right but that unfortunately started to appear normal to me like it was something that was expected something that I just had to deal with and so I dealt with that you know I jumped head first into things I didn't like doing because I felt like that's just what you have to do in life and then as the years started to go by and I started to kind of wake up consciously and realize like that doesn't have to be the case, I started to transform into a different version of myself, the version that you see today. So the version of me that was just 18, you know, in a boyfriend, girlfriend relationship with my now wife, no kids, you know, I was just so unsure of everything around me. I had no idea who I was or who I wanted to be. And you know, again, six years of the Air Force later, um, I have discovered who I wanted to be and started to put those things into place. And now, like, I'm well on the path of being exactly who I want to be. That transformation that happened within you is something that we will see every time we turn on the TV to watch wrestling. We see people transform with, from, you know, kind of their normal normal persona into this larger than life character. Now yours was a little bit more natural, but what did you take from being a wrestling fan, watching these guys when you were a kid that helped you kind of find your own path? Uh, it's definitely the talking piece, right? Like you watch somebody like to like The Rock and you, you see his wordplay, how he can just shred his opponent on the mic before they even get into the ring. He's already won the match before they even get into the ring because win or lose, he already torched you on the mic. That's all that people are gonna remember, right? So what I realized is like, man, this microphone has a lot of power and I don't mind using it. I used to practice promos like in the mirror all the time. Like any, any wrestler today will tell you the same thing. Like, oh yeah, I used to practice, you know, promos in the mirror and everything and blah, blah, blah. My cardboard title and stuff. We all have like the same, kind of journey that we took 
And obviously I'm not a wrestler, even though I did try it. Um, but public speaking, that portion of it, the promos and stuff, I took that from wrestling and just put that into practice in my own life. And that's why like public speaking was never really a big deal to me because all my heroes did it, you know, like everybody that I watched on TV, they talked on the mic all the time. So to me, it wasn't really a big deal. Like I, the way that I saw it was I deserve this spot right now. People are not here to see me fail. They're here to see me steal the show. Let me steal the show. You know, and I, it's, it's a, it's definitely a mindset thing, right? You have to feel like you deserve to be where you are holding that microphone. And for some reason, ever since I was a little kid, I've felt like I deserved to be in that spot holding that microphone. And that's what's made it pretty easy for me to do this kind of stuff, you know, in my adult life. When you touched on earlier, having that opportunity at PG Community College that you got into some of the broadcasting, when did you see that that kind of might be a path for you? Funny story, right? Um, <laughs> I was watching this guy on YouTube. I love to give him credit because he's really the person who kind of sparked this idea in my mind of like, okay, maybe I like this commentary thing. Let's start here. He's a YouTuber named Mr. Hurricane, and he's still active now. So I've been watching this man for like 11 years. And what he does is he starts a franchise on Madden, just like anybody else would. Um, we start, you know, we pick our team. We, you know, we play the games. We build our team up. We try to win championships and stuff, right? He actually records every game, edits it down, and does commentary over the game. So it feels like you're watching a game with him doing play-by-play -play commentary over it. And I saw that concept and I was like, I'm going to try that too. So I tried it. Um, and that's when I realized, wow, like my, my voice is actually pretty good on this stuff. And I was getting comments in the comment section saying the same thing. And I was like, how can I do this in real life? So I ended up at PG in the communications program. And next thing you knew, they were like, yeah, we want to start streaming our basketball games. I was like, I'm your guy to do this play-by-play -play commentary. And like, yeah, that's, that's, uh, you know, everybody has their own, weird path. Oh man. Yeah. I heard Ben Scully and I was just hooked. I knew I wanted to do that. No, I, I heard some random YouTuber. Right. <laughs> and, and then after I heard that random YouTuber, I heard Gus Johnson and I was like, man, these guys are awesome. Like I want to do this. And that's, that's pretty much how that ended up happening. How different was your play-by-play -play commentary then, than what it became when you came to us? Oh, it, it was awful back then. <laughs> it was absolutely awful, but I didn't have any coaching. Yeah, sure. Right? Like it, it was just kind of like a, Hey, we want to give you this opportunity, you know, go out there and do it. You know what I mean? And like, like I say, it was awful, but it was only awful compared to what I'm able to do now. You know, back then for me, just starting out, I got to give myself credit. I, I sounded pretty good. I sounded competent. I sounded like I at least had a little bit of an idea of what I was supposed to be doing. But I didn't understand research. I didn't understand, um, you know, storytelling through the commentary or whatever. I was just calling the action, which is fine. It's a, it's a, it's a JUCO college, right? They're not expecting Mike Tirico at a JUCO college, you know, getting a stream basketball game. But, you know, it was it was my first foot in the door. It was my first opportunity. The first thing that, like, kind of planted a seed of, like, this is something that you're capable of doing and getting better at. And as the years went on, I was able to do that to where I came here to full sale on the very first game that I called with uh, Gus Dominguez, who's awesome, by the way, love that man so much. Wish I could call another game with him so badly. Uh, I called the game with him and it was awesome. You know, Jeff Radcliffe was giving us props. Gus was talking to us at halftime. He was like, yeah, just sent this to some students. I was like, this is what you got to need to sound like. And I was like, wow, that that's, that's crazy. Like this is a, uh, I must be pretty, good at this stuff and I feel like I can get even better and uh yeah so you know from there to 2012 oh my gosh miles ahead but like I gotta show myself love my my 18 year old self love that was just trying to figure it out by himself like I didn't sound I didn't sound incompetent which is like the only thing I really could have asked for in that situation well, when natural talent meets the hard work and the determination, that's when you really get somewhere. And that's what you put in. That's why Alfonso is now, uh, among other things, the host of the Manifest Wrestling Podcast. We'll talk more about that and the many hats he wears professionally in a little bit. But before we get there, 
you brought up your time as a staff sergeant in the U.S. Air Force and called it a life-changing experience. I mean, I think it's obvious that learning discipline and maturity and things like that come out of that kind of an experience. But is there something that you can point to that maybe we might not expect that your military experience helped you with as you went on later in your life? Um, Honestly, diversity, right? Like, we talk about all the personal things that the military can do for you. Like you said, the discipline, you know, the punctuality, um, the attention to detail, hard work, determination, things like that. But like really the diversity is what helped me because it taught me not to take anything so personally, right? Like if I can get candid here in 2024, America is divided politically, socially, all that stuff. Right. And there's people on one side of the fence, they call it the left, and then the other side of the fence, they call it the right. And then there's people somewhere in the middle, which I like to consider myself like somewhere there in the middle. And the reason why I'm there in the middle is because I've had an opportunity to spend quality time with really decent people that believe both sides of the spectrum and kind of understand where they come from and you know why they feel the way they feel about everything. And what it's showed me is that nobody's necessarily wrong and nobody's right. It's just we're all trying to figure out how it applies to our personal lives. And that's helped me give grace to everybody around me. That's helped me have conversations, healthy conversations with everyone around me to where I can look anybody in the eye, shake their hand and listen to what they have to say and not be offended by any of it. Yeah, maybe I might disagree. I might strongly disagree with something that they say. I might think it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life, but I understand there's something behind it, right? There's a reason why they feel the way they feel, whether it's because of an experience they had or whether it's because they've never taken the time to have an experience that they probably should have. It's, it's an understanding that I've been able to gain because I've talked to so many different people and like really heard them out and really tried to understand where they're coming from with everything that they feel and everything that they believe in their life. And it's it's truly helped me become the person that I am today who can really keep my emotions together, which is so important nowadays, right? We have so many like media people who immediately discredit themselves because they get too emotional. Instead of reporting on facts or just presenting facts, they let their emotion get in the way. Whereas me, I'm not going to have that issue because of my life experiences. And then also the cultures that I've been able to experience, you know, not just diversity of belief, but diversity of backgrounds and cultures. Like I have been all over the world. I've been in South Korea, but I've also looked into North Korea with binoculars and seen the, the stark differences between the two countries while I'm there. I've been to Italy, I've been to the UK, I've been to Africa, I've been to um, Croatia, you know, I've been to Slovenia, I've been to all these different places where people do things very differently from each other, even though the countries are right next to each other, right? And it's it's all about like respecting people's cultures, people's backgrounds. And in a day and age where it's so easy to get canceled, that is a very good tool to have to, to be able to know what to say and what not to say at any given moment. That's, I think, is going to lend itself to me having a very, very long and successful career in the future. Yeah, it's helped you with all those perspectives. And I know it's also inspired your love for travel because you did live in several different places, Italy, uh, South Korea, even in South Carolina, right? You, you're, yeah. You've been all over the place. Um, those travels, what have been some of the highlights for you in terms of kind of growing personally when you have traveled? I... Again, I think it's I think it's just experiencing the fact that people do things differently everywhere you go. And, you know, you can you could bring it to anything politics, you could bring it to even religion. You know, if you go in different areas of the world, you will realize people do things differently and believe in different things everywhere you go. It'll teach you very, very quickly that even though you thought you were 100 percent right about whatever it is that you believe there's a chance that you're not actually right because there's a whole different region of the country, I mean, of, of the world that is doing something entirely different than you are. And they also believe they're 100% right. So who's to say who's right? It's taught me to be open to everything, to have love and 
and compassion and empathy and sympathy for everything around me. And to have understanding that just because somebody disagrees with me doesn't mean that they're wrong or that they have the wrong idea about anything. It just means that they have a different background. They have a different perspective. And it's up to me to respect that or not. And I'm going to choose to respect it every single time because my experience is not theirs. Right. So like that, that culture, like I, I would not trade that experience for anything, you know, um, like I encourage everybody that I talk to, please turn, turn CNN off for a second. Right. And it's weird for me saying like, I'm the media guy. I want you to watch TV. Right. But I also want you to turn it off for a second. After you've watched your one newscast, watch your hour newscast of the day. Cool. Catch up on what's going on. But then walk outside, go somewhere, like realize that the danger, the the despair, everything that you've been shown and presented, it's not that dark and gloomy. There's a bright, beautiful world out there filled with great people who still have those same manners and compassion that you claim that they did back in your day. You know what I mean? Like, no, people <laughs> yeah, sure. are, like that still exists. That still exists. My generation right? People like to, people like to rag on millennials or whatever it is that they want to call us. Like there are some real world changers out here, people that are changing the world in the most positive ways. Of course, there's evil out here. There's always going to be, there's nothing we can do about that, but there's so much good out here too, that's not being displayed and shown and just traveling around the world and going outside and just interacting with people has showed me that as well. That all helped you grow up quickly, as did having a family. And, you know, you got married fairly young. You had your first child fairly young. Um, yeah. How has that changed your life and brought that joy and happiness that you were just talking about to another level for you? Um, taught me a lot of responsibility. It's matured me fast in that area. I've always been somebody that's like very mature compared to my peers, um, but it's like now I'm only 29 years old, right? I'll be 30 in November, but let's pump the brakes on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in my twenties. And, um, you know, I, I've gotten to the point now because of how much my marriage and my, you know, fatherhood has matured me that I can fit into rooms with 50 year old men and not feel out of place. And a lot of my friends are 50 year old men or like men in their forties. You know, I think about the entire faculty of the Nan Patrick School and the relationships I have with you all. I think about the relationship I have with Devon Dudley. I think about uh, even my Madden League that I'm in. Like, it has a lot of 40, 50-year-old men in there, and we just vibe and fit in. Like, it's nothing. Like, I'm not even in my 20s, you know? And that's because the way that I've, the way that my life has progressed has matured me at a faster rate than maybe some of my peers. I do know a lot of 29-year-olds who still don't have anything figured out not I'm not even talking like financially or career wise I'm just talking about like inward emotionally they still can't control their emotions they still can't get places on time they still can't do things independently for themselves and I don't know if that's normal you know what I mean because that's just not how I am I have I have matured very very quickly and you know I owe that to the life experiences that I have had you know I don't think necessarily that was just born better than anybody. I just think I've had different experiences than others and maybe their life experiences will mature them at a different rate, you know what I mean? But at this point in my life with, with a wife, with a child, with another child on the way in July, I have had to take a lot of big steps and make more grown up decisions, right? And, um, you know, I would, again, an experience that I wouldn't change for the world because like, I, I just love who I am now. I love the person that I've become. Well, and I can tell from just my experiences around you that following passion is important to you. So when you completed your military time, when you took that GI Bill money and you decided to come to Full Sail, um, having that support from your family and also maybe being someone who wanted to show them like, hey, you go after it, right? Uh, how much did that factor into your decision to come to us? Um, I, I got to give that all to my wife. Um, she, you know, I brought, I brought the idea to her and I was like, I was like, babe, how do you feel? Like, could we do this? And without any hesitation, it was a yes. I was like, wow, that was 
that was quick. Are you sure? <laughs> like, did you did you think about it for a second? And yeah, you know, I remembered we had taken our honeymoon in Orlando in 2017. I remember as soon as we had gotten off the plane that night, our first night here, she was like, she just felt the air. And she was like, you know, I feel like this is a place I could live in the future. Hmm. And uh, it was funny because I was like, yeah, okay, just wait till that sun comes up. We'll see if you're, <laughs> you're staying the same. <laughs> and she was struggling, but she still, uh, she still really enjoyed the area. And so like, at, you know, after the initial shock of her saying yes so fast, I thought about it and I was like, yeah, it actually makes sense that she would say yes because she basically already said yes three years ago. And, um, you know, I, I submitted the application, I got accepted, and we moved everything down here, all our pets, uh, family, furniture, all that stuff. We moved it down here and uh, the rest was history. You know, 20 months later, I was holding a bachelor's degree. There were a lot of places you could have gone and done something similar, maybe not quite exactly what we do, but something along the same path. Why did you choose us? This was the only school for me. I, I'm very in tune with, um, you know, get, giving you a little bit of a peek into, like, I guess my spiritual beliefs, because I, I don't really do the whole religion thing. But the, the my spiritual beliefs, I'm very in tune with, like, my ancestors, my guides. Um, I see angel numbers all the time decrypt those angel numbers, figure out what the messages are that are being sent to me. I'm very in tune with God, spend time and mindfulness, all that good stuff. And there was never a doubt about Full Sail being the school for me because it was shown to me about 10 years before I decided to come here. I saw Full Sail back when I was in high school. And I always said, man, that that would, that would be a place I would like to go because I had vacationed to Orlando like three times already. My family loves coming down here. This this is like this is like their favorite vacation spot. Right. So uh, living living here in Orlando, well, in Winter Park, rather, is like it's it's kind of it's kind of surreal. It's like this is our favorite vacation spot. But when I thought when I saw Full Sail and I saw it was in the Orlando area, it was kind of like, you know, Seeds get planted at some point. You never know when they're going to actually sprout and grow into something, but like they're always there. You know, you might see something and then 10 years later, it's time to like act on it. And you're like, oh man, yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah, it is time. Let's do this. You know what I mean? That's what it was for me. It was, uh, you know, while I was in the military, I had seen that the Dan Patrick School Sports Casting had become a thing. Um, you know, several years before that, I had seen the Full Sail was a thing. Right. Like back in like 2012, when I was about to graduate, that's when I had learned that Full Sail was a school. Then the Dan Patrick School became a thing and another seed was planted. Oh, man, that that looks like it would be a fun school to go to. Yeah, we'll see what happens. And then, you know, you just kind of forget about it. And then years later, it ends up popping up again. Right. And like I, I just I knew I was in the right place, too, when I got to Full Sail, because as soon as I got there, I felt something different than I had ever felt before. In my career leading up to that point, I had felt either one of two things. I had felt either support from somebody, you know, like they want me to win, but they just can't really get me there. Or they can get me there, but they don't really want to see me win. This was the first place I had ever been where I got both, where they wanted to see me win and they could get me to the places that I could win. And that's how I really knew I was at the right place. I tell people all the time, man, networking in this industry is so huge. And the network that I've built at Full Sail has been the cause of so many of the jobs and opportunities that I've been able to get. Alfonso Speaks is really the only one that I've ever had to like create for myself and build myself from the ground up without any assistance from you know the full self faculty or anything like that that's the first one i've had to do that with the other ones manifest wrestling karate combat nccaa etc cetera, etc cetera. florida athletics network all came from connections at full cell whether it be eric rutledge whether it be you whether it be uh gus you know somebody has hooked me up every single time and that's how i knew i was in the right place i'm like these these guys are seeing my talent and instead of trying to cut my legs from under me, like so many others have done in my past, they are elevating me. They're trying to like throw me to the moon so that I can soar and just, you know, reach my full potential.
Well, it was always fun to watch you interact with Gus Ramsey, our program director, because you guys had a Father. special bond. Well, that was just where I was just going to go with that, that you got to the point where you talk, talk that he was like a father-like figure to you. Um, yeah. What makes your relationship with him what it is? Transparency and just realness. Um, I always feel like I deserve to be in whatever room that I'm in. I never feel like oh, somebody new is walking into this room and they hold this title. Let me act a little bit different than I was acting before. No, you're going to get the same energy that I'm giving everybody else, right? I'm, I'm, I pride myself on being the realest person in the room. Right? I'm, I'm cutthroat. I'm very like honest. I'm very transparent about my wins and my losses, everything. And when it came to Gus, my first interactions with him, I think he could tell, like, this guy does not care that I'm the program director. <laughs> Like, of course, I was going to show him res the respect that he deserved, but like I show that respect to everybody. So it didn't feel any different than how I was treating everybody else. And I think Gus gravitated towards that. And then on top of that, once he got the taste of that personality, he saw the talent behind it. And, you know, we just developed a great relationship, you know, after that. And, you know, I got his number. We always talk about wrestling and stuff. We text each other during SmackDown, like, oh my gosh, are you watching this? Like, you know, we we just we interact on a different level than you know I would have expected when I first met him. Uh this wasn't what I was looking for necessarily, but like I wasn't gonna shy away from it because again, it's not that weird to me to have friends that are, you know, like mentors and friends that are like double my age or whatever. I, I, I don't know exactly how old Gus is. He'll probably kill me <laughs> for saying I'm he's double my age. But yeah, you know, Gus just is just for the record, he's not double your age. Yeah, he's not double my age, but that's that's an exaggeration. But like it he's he's old, he's much older than than I am, but it doesn't matter. We just vibe so well together. And you know, I tell him about everything. He knows that I've changed my mind on what I want to do in my career like 20 different times. <laughs> and I tell him every single time and he loves to make fun of me for it. But, you know, that, that's that's a part of who I am. That's a part of my life path number, actually. My life path number is five. And people with life path number fives change their mind all the time. They can't stay in one place for too long. It gets it gets extremely boring. Right? And we, we just have to move. Around. That's why I travel so much as well, because I always have to be seen and doing something new um so you know what he he just understands he understands me i get his humor he gets my humor and you know it just it was easy we didn't have to force anything things just clicked between me and him and next thing you knew i was like you know obviously you know i i have my father in my life uh but you know it just became a running joke of like you know i would just call him father every day because you know that that's just how we kind of operate it. And then one day he just called me son back. And then I was like, okay, cool. We're locked in. And that, that's it. <laughs> you know I mean? That's Alfonso McCree Jr. I mean, he's been doing work since he was with us as an editor for catapult sports, among many other things he's done. But, you know, you talked about changing your mind and going down different paths. One of the benefits for you while you were with us is you got to put your hat in a lot of different places. You got to try a lot of different things, but I must imagine that, the situation that you came in with, with a wife, with a child, and and on top of all the work that you had to do for classwork to do everything else, that must have been challenging, especially from a time management standpoint. How did you do it? Yeah, like not a lot of people know this, but we actually had a situation that first summer that we were uh, at Full Sail. So we came, we moved down here in February 2021. We had a situation like in that July 2021 where we were just at a very bad apartment complex, um, bad management, uh, at just absolutely horrendous, unacceptable management, right? And we had visited home, we came back and we came back to mold basically all over, all over our apartment. Now, granted, my son has asthma hmm. and so he can't, he couldn't, you know, live in that or, or breathe in that. So we had to figure something out. Fortunately, we had family with timeshares and so they were able to get us places to stay down in uh, Kissimmee while we tried to figure everything out. Um, so that's where we ended up staying. So I'm commuting back and forth from Full Sail to Kissimmee like every single day for, for class. And then somehow during the span of that happening, 
while we're staying at the timeshare, we end up totaling our car. So we don't have a car. So we had to rent a car and we're again, still traveling back and forth and everything of that nature. Um, big shout out to my buddy, Mike Nistico, who uh, gave us a lot of assistance um, during that time, you know, just, you know, being in the timeshare with us and driving us where we needed to go and everything like that much appreciated to him. Um, but that was uh that was a really challenging time. And I believe, I believe it was during Project Portfolio 3. I believe that's the one with uh with like the live shots and and things like that, uh, that you have to start doing. Not Gordy's live shots, the but the other ones, the mm -hmm. like pre-recorded ones. Um so you know, we we were going through it at that time. You know, obviously my wife is staying home with Zane. Zane's a handful. She's still healing from the accident. And, you know, I'm still coming to to school every day and just trying to do my best. And, um, you know, I think after, after that time period, because we ended up getting another apartment, like right down the street from the school, like it was, it was a blessing. Somebody was subleasing their apartment because they needed to move to take care of their mom. We found it on Facebook marketplace. We immediately went there and we're like, yeah, we'll take it. Um, it was within our budget, like way within our budget. And we were like, this is, this is perfect, you know? Um, so everything did end up working out, but that was a very like challenging time period in our lives. And what it taught me about myself is that for lack of better terms, IDGAF, you know, a lot of you guys know what that means. I didn't care about what was going on. I was still going to present the best projects in class. I was still going to try to get the best grades out of everybody. I was working my tail off because I didn't see excuses as an option. And I decided I was going to do what I needed to do, regardless of whatever it was that was going on. I didn't care. I did not care. And I can't stress that enough. I did not care about what was going on. I was going to do whatever it is that I had to do. I pushed through that. I ended up getting an A in that class. I ended up getting an A in my next class. I did not care. And, you know, after that had happened and we finally got settled in, you know, our new apartment, I was like, man, if I got through that, the rest of this is going to be easy. And it was, you know, that's, that's how it felt to me. Like everything started to feel pretty easy after that. And there were some challenging assignments and everything, but I didn't really see them as challenging assignments. I saw them as more opportunities to show myself what I'm capable of. And, um, you know, just after going through all of that, like that, that was probably the roughest time period that I've had in the last five years. And nobody would have known it, right? Nobody would have known it because I didn't really feel like it was something I needed to talk about and tell people I was going through. I just needed to work harder because obviously I was being challenged for some reason. So I decided to just work harder. And, um, you know, it. I inspired myself in a lot of ways with that time period. You know, I, I inspired myself to understand like, man, you are destined for greatness. If you can, if you can do that and push through and still get A's in your classes and still get like a hundred on assignments and stuff like you like you got this, like you, you are built for this. You are built different, you know? And um, yeah, that that's just, it's one of the biggest time periods of my life. I attribute a lot of my mental fortitude to those two to three months right there. That's the thing about adversity is it's horrible to deal with, right? But if you can get through it and you can find some, some confidence out of it, because as you said, if I can do, if I can do that, I can do anything, right? And it, it does build strength. It's it's interesting. And I was just thinking about this because I had this literally right by me. Uh, one of our other graduates, his name is Brian Argot. He sent me a book when he graduated that he said changed his life. And I'm not done with it yet, but I started reading. I don't know how well you can see this. It's called The Obstacle is the Way. And basically the idea hmm. of the book is that if you can take any misfortune of your life and turn it on its head and finding a positive uh, way around it. Basically, you're going to take your obstacle and instead of the obstacle holding you back, it's going to push you forward. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. And uh, it's just amazing to me, the stuff that you were able to accomplish during your time with us. And that included a lot of different things. As I said, um, how did those extracurricular activities make your life better and now make you better as a broadcaster? Again, networking, 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 man. Like, 
Yeah, we could talk about the reps. We could talk about the the side money I was able to make, you know, getting paid a hundred dollars to do a play by play gig was awesome, you know, especially not being paid before. Like that that was really awesome. Like uh NCCAA, they broke they they brought out the Brinks truck <laughs> pretty much compared to what I had been making before. But above all above all of that, above all of those experiences and stuff, the network that I've been able to gain has been the most important to me. Like I, I value my network over everything because that's what leads to all those different, you know, opportunities that I get. Like I I know so many people now. I'm so well connected now. So many people know who I am and what I'm capable of that, you know, because that's the important part. It's like, oh yeah, I know this guy. Okay, cool. But do they like actually know you or do you just know them? <laughs> you know, and they know me. They know who I am. They know what I can do. And that's been so vital to my career. Every time a big opportunity pops up, I get an email like, hey, I wanted to offer this to you first. Um, you know, if if you can do it, let me know. And 90 percent of the time I can do it and it pays me very well. And you're, you're not going to find these opportunities on Indeed or Glassdoor or whatever. You're going to find them through your network, through people who know people and they like you. So they want to hook you up. That's where all my stuff keeps coming from. That's where my podcast came from. That's where NCCAA came from. That's where Karate Combat came from. That's where all this different stuff that I'm able to do now. Uh, Catapult Sports, where I worked for a couple of years, that's where that that came from my network. I, I didn't find that on Indeed. I got an email about that. You know, like this is the stuff that I'm talking about. When we talk about networking, like it can literally carry you forward to a successful career. And people like, I, I cannot stress that enough. Networking is the most important thing you can do in this career field. It's more important than having a great resume and a great reel. You need to have your network solid. Your foundation of people around you has to be solid. Like networking, that that's like the biggest word that I can continue to stress during this episode is networking. And being so close to WWE and the Performance Center and NXT and everything while you were at Full Sail, obviously by the belts behind you, we know how important wrestling is in your life. You host a wrestling <laughs> yeah. podcast, but you were able to network with them uh, to the point where they actually asked you for an extra audition tape to, to look after a job for you. Um, what uh, was it like to be so close and work so closely with WWE, a, you know, a company that you grew up loving and kind of dreaming of one day being a part of? Yeah, like, you know, I ended up finding, through working with the volunteer program in NXT, I ended up finding, like, I don't think this job culture is the job culture for me, but that's okay. Because just the honor of having them even look in my direction like this is wwe we're talking about a billion dollar company and they gave me an audition you know whether it was in person or through video it doesn't matter to me they they looked at me they wanted to see some of my stuff i can carry that with me forever that means the absolute world to me this is the company i've been watching since i was four years old and the fact that they had any interest in me whatsoever is enough for me to go ahead and check that off of my bucket list right because like i said so i think I think at times we might think like we want certain things and then we kind of experience a taste of them. And we're like, oh, well, maybe that's not for me. And, you know, th that isn't to talk bad on the company. It's just saying the culture there, the way that they did things is not really how I saw, you know, my career, you know, being molded by like that. That's not the environment that I wanted my, my career to transpire. And then that's OK. You know what I mean? But uh, I was able to gain, like I said, a lot of friends networking. Again, I have a lot of people in my network now. And that's a big milestone moment for me. WWE was interested in bringing me in. That's kind of a crazy sentence for yeah, me to it's, even it's say awesome. out loud. Yeah, it's it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm grateful for it. I don't have a bad thing to say about any of them. It's just, I don't think it, it was, it was kind of like a me decision. Like I stepped, uh, I stepped away and kind of decided like you know this isn't really the environment for me i don't think but i appreciate them even having me around you know entertaining the possibility of bringing me in like it meant the world to me
Well, you were just talking about friendships. You made some great friendships through the program and people who have gone on to be successful, much like you. You mentioned Mike earlier and uh, just a great group of people that I know you drew some extra inspiration with pushing you, pushing you to be valedictorian and advanced achievement award winner. How much did those others that were with you in the program, that were working with you side by side and sometimes in competition, how did that help you become a better Alfonso? It's, it's, it's going to sound kind of messed up, right? Because like, those are my guys. Like I love Mike. I love AJ. I love Zach, but I am a Scorpio. And what that means is I wanted to take every single thing. <laughs> I didn't want to leave anything for yeah. anybody else. Like <laughs> it, it sounds toxic. It sounds selfish, but you know what? It is what it is. It's just how I'm built. Like I, I don't, I don't play for second place. Um, I play to win. And when I found out that there were awards, course director awards, advanced achievement, valedictorian, I immediately set out to be the very best. And the way that they helped me, especially Mike, I'll say Mike is like super, super talented. He really is. He's charismatic. He's uh, he's fun to watch on camera. Um, he has a lot of energy. He's a good reader. He's a good storyteller. And I was like, internally mike i'm gonna be better than you i'm sorry but <laughs> i'm gonna be better than you like you're not no mm -mm. you get a better grade on me i mean a better grade on an assignment than me i'm gonna have an attitude about it because i'm holding myself to this huge standard of being the best of absolutely being the best and you know they they definitely pushed me in a lot of ways and then a lot of ways you know we we ended up working together and creating a lot of great magic together uh you know, the toe and so not in the morning thing that me and Mike did amazing stuff. <laughs> like we, we just, we took everything about our friendship, the goofiness of it all, and just put it together on screen. And it turned out like that. And that was absolutely fantastic. So, you know, maybe, maybe inadvertently, you know, they, they set themselves, they set themselves up by being as good as they were because they just made me that much better. And I was like, I'm not losing anything to these guys. But then also like, you know, just as my buddies, they definitely helped. They gave me honest feedback. Um, we worked well together. You know, we were all uber focused on like what we wanted to accomplish while we were there. And, uh, you know, I think, I think we, all four of us really benefited from it. And, you know, I, I'd like to, I like to think we're honestly one of the best classes that's come out of the program like that. And that's just, you know, that's just me. I, I, I like to think that the talent and the, the, you know, the work ethic and stuff that we all displayed, like, I feel like it was, I feel like it was a, a standard setter. Well, it made it fun for, for me and every other course director that you had. It was a pleasure to work with all you guys, but kind of the hardest part of our job, uh, then you all turn pro and now yeah. You are doing it professionally. What's it like living the dream right now? It feels different than I thought it would. So like I mentioned earlier, I, I tell Gus a million different things about what I want to do, right? I changed my mind all the time. Like at first I wanted to work at a news station. Then I wanted to work at a big network. And now I'm at the point where I'm realizing working at home and creating my own stuff feels so much better. It feels so much better. It, it feels so much more freeing. You know, I make one video a day. I spend about maybe two hours working on it. And then the rest of my day is free and I'm making money from my stuff. And then, you know, I have these side projects, these side companies that maybe want to bring me in for a few days at a time and stuff, but I'm not tied to them. You know what I mean? It feels, I didn't realize how freeing my career could be. I thought I was going to have to be locked down to somewhere with a contract with all this stuff. And what I'm actually seeing is that there's just different ways to succeed in this business. Not everybody's journey looks the same. We have a lot of great people in the news. We have KJ Doyle, right? We have uh, Demetrius Gamble, um, Ellie Davis, uh, Brandon Daniels, obviously doing his thing with Sushi Grade Media, going all over the world, just doing golf stuff. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> we have Mike up with, uh, with Rutgers Hockey. Like we have... All these different people, Rodney Washington, my boy, just went to Albany, Georgia. Like he's able to do his thing in his hometown, which I'm so proud of. Um, you know, you look at all these different people that are killing it in the news. And then you look at maybe a Darren Healy who's working uh with media with the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, 
you know, you look at just all the different ways that you can take this stuff and apply it to a successful career. Like, how do I go to a sports casting program, learn sports casting for 20 months, What's going on, everybody? and then use those tools that you all taught me to create a true crime YouTube channel? <laughs> well, let's talk about that, because you just talked about how that was the one thing that that was all you. You, you kind of did it yourself. So take us through how you got started with that and how you've been able to make it so successful. Yeah, so uh, there is this one specific trial, the Waukesha Christmas Parade trial from back in, uh, actually last year, November and October of 2022. The act transpired in November of 2021. So it basically happened, this man, Daryl Brooks, runs through the Waukesha Christmas Parade, runs over about 68, 69 people, kills six. And he's apprehended and he sits in jail for a year, he's put on trial and he's convicted six life sentences and like, like a thousand years total, basically. He got like a thousand years in, in, in state prison. Never like that has to be a record of some kind, but that's how, that's how much stuff he did that day. So the interesting part about the trial and why people couldn't stop watching it is because he represented himself. He fired his defense attorneys and represented himself. So it was him versus these, you know, state attorneys. And he basically made these huge scenes in court, these outbursts, these ridiculous questions, all types of stuff. It was just, it. people can take their eyes off of this trial. I was one of those people. And I would watch these reaction videos. I would watch people like J9Eve, AG Tactical, uh, Lyle's Music, uh, Beefy Has Anxiety, all these different channels that I would be watching that are doing these Daryl Brooks videos. And one day it kind of clicked to me. Wait a second. I could do these videos too. Like I know OBS. I know how to do this stuff. I know how to put these videos together. All I have to do is figure out the screen capture stuff. So I immediately went on YouTube, taught myself some things. And next thing you knew, I was putting out my videos and people immediately gravitated towards it. Like immediately, I was stunned. I, I couldn't believe my eyes about why, like, why do you how think quickly. they were gravitated toward it? A, a number of different reasons. One, this, this particular community, you know how you, you Gus, the entire faculty have always told us about like market shares of you know, content, right? You you tell us like, be careful about covering the NBA because unless you can give us some type of insight that ESPN can't, you know, what, how are you going to retain like a large audience? Which makes complete sense, right? For me, I looked at the market of Daryl Brooks content creators and I realized there's only about 10 or 11 of them that are really popular on YouTube. And I was like, there's room for me there because there's hundreds and thousands of hundreds of thousands of people in a whole bunch of different countries and, and you know including the united states the uk all those countries canada all that that want to watch this content and i'm like i can do this so a lot of you are probably wondering why judge duro is entertaining this it's literally just to keep the record clear and concise that's the only reason she's engaging in any dialogue with him so the comp the type of comments that i get she's not letting no, no, have his way in the they're, the, they're the weirdest comments ever my, just, just a little <laughs> background my uh my my age demographics for my audience, I get a lot of women between 45 and like basically 45 and up. Um and they they are some uh they are some wild, wild women on there. Um I keep a lot of them around because they claim I have a sexy voice and well spoken <laughs> and uh they think I'm handsome. <laughs> and that keeps a lot of them. Uh, that keeps a lot of them around. And uh, of course they come for the Dale Brooks content, but they're they're staying for me. <laughs> and the reason I know they're staying for me is because I also look at how people find my videos in the search bar and the leading uh, category at about 40% is Alfonso Speaks. So that means they're looking directly for me, which is a great thing. Excellent. Um, but they're they're staying because I'm well-spoken. Well -spoken. They also believe I'm empathetic. Um, I don't try to make a mockery of it. Uh, you know, I, they like the frequency in which I pause the video and talk, you know, they like that I'm not too long winded when I do have something to say over the video and kind of like really, doing good play by play, huh? 
Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. It like it, it's literally like a lot of them are like, oh, you should get into radio. I'm like, if you only knew. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I do direct them to my other projects and, and things like that. I'll probably direct them. Well, not probably. I will uh, 100 percent direct them to this podcast episode. Once, awesome. Uh, you know, once this is uploaded, but they they stay because they like me which is great. That's what I wanted, you know, because I tell them at the beginning, I'm like, hey, this isn't the Daryl Brooks channel, but this is the trial that we're going to cover right now because I want to cover this trial. And I also, I also keep you guys' words in the back of my mind. You guys' words are very similar to Nipsey Hussle's words. And you guys said the same thing. What you said is when you promise something, deliver it. Nipsey also said the same thing. I promised them that when I went up to Wisconsin for this Green Bay trip, I told them I would stop in, in Waukesha and do a live stream tour of Daryl Brooks and the path that he took that day going from Frame Park to uh, past White Rock School in Waukesha, down to Main Street, running through all the people, taking the curve. Uh, I showed them where the car was recovered. I showed them the house where... Daryl Brooks was arrested. I promised them that I was going to do that and I delivered on it and they appreciated it. And that video is doing really well. And uh, they, they stay because I deliver on what I say that I'm going to do. And that's one of the biggest fundamentals that you all taught us at Full Sail. When you tease something, you better deliver that something. And that's always rang in the back of my head. And I, you know, make sure that I follow up on what I say I'm going to do. Yeah, there's something about accountability, and I'm sure that's come into play with your job with Karate Combat now. I know that's a lot of fun. You're doing some travel for that, being a ring announcer. What's that adventure been like for you? Fighting out of the red corner, representing Republica Dominicana, Alejandro Bruca. Absolutely freeing and eye-opening i always felt like i had a passion for some type of announcing but i thought it was public address announcing like they mean four or three like i thought mm -hmm. i thought that was like my thing but what i've actually realized is that ring announcing is my thing i'm really good at it i feel really passionate about it i have heroes in that industry heroes like howard finkel um modern day heroes like samantha urban uh, Bruce Buffer is another one of my heroes. If you listen to how I deliver my ring announcing, I actually take a lot of stuff from him. And, you know, I, it's, it's something special to me being a part of people's moments, like moments that they'll never forget in their life for those fighters. When we do that, when we did the show in Dominican Republic a few months ago, and you know, I have an opportunity to re to introduce the fighters that are representing the Dominican Republic. Representing Republica Dominicana, Jorge El And just hearing the crowd explode when I tell them that they're from the Dominican Republic, it's like, it's unreal because that's a moment that they're never going to forget. They're fighting in front of their, their people, their home country. Like they're like, it's a, it's an art form. It's, it's an enhancer ring announcing is, and I don't take that responsibility lightly. It's very important to me. I don't just say the names. I put energy and passion behind the names that I'm saying to the point where when we get to the end of the night and I'm done ring announcing, my throat is sore because I've put so much energy into saying their names and i don't regret it either like i'll, I'll walk around with a sore throat if i have to mm -hmm. after i after i do that i don't care you know because they deserve that they've been training for weeks sometimes months for this fight this moment should be made as big of a deal as possible for them and that's what i try to do well i know you've also tried to as you've gone through this adventure throughout broadcasting throughout your your whole life journey um, your family is so important to you. And it's fun to see that you you have a YouTube channel with videos with them too. That's fun to yeah. watch. But how much do they inspire you to be the best Alfonso you can be? Um, every single day, they are reminding me, particularly my wife, reminding me of my potential and reminding me of the things that I can create for myself because it does get scary sometimes. Like, oh, I'm relying on this this YouTube channel. 
to like make my living off of. And she's like, you can do this. Like, look at how much it's growing and how fast it's growing. You can do this without any sweat. And having her remind me of that constantly really does help because that's what she's done every step of the way for anything that I want to do, anything that maybe I don't have confidence, uh, you know, and maybe somebody didn't give me a call back or maybe somebody uh, chose a, a different person for the job or something like things that really get me down in the moment. She brings me right back up and says, remember who you are, you know, make them regret not choosing you channel that energy and make them regret not choosing you. Next time they choose you, show them it was a mistake for them to ever use anybody else. And I keep I keep that because I it's a of course it's a balance. You don't want to be arrogant, right? But you also have to know who you are and know your value. And she's reminded me of that so much. And it's to the point now where like I said I I feel like I belong and deserve to be in any room that I step foot in, no matter where I am. I don't care who's in the room. I don't care what their social status is. I'm in this room for a reason. God put me in this room for a reason. I belong here. I deserve to be here. Let me show you why I deserve to be here. And then I just go and put forth the best show possible that I can at all times. And she's instilled that confidence in me. She was one of the key factors in me deciding to separate from the military because she was like, don't waste your talent anymore. You have a gift in your voice. Your people gravitate towards your voice. They love the sound of your voice. And I'm like, this is just my voice. I'm just talking. And she's like, no, like some people have the gift of singing. Some people are born to play football. Some people are born to be political leaders. Some people are born to speak because that is the gift that they have been born with and supplied with. Use it, don't waste it. And I'm like, okay. And it, when, you know, when you make it sound like that, it's not just, it's not just Alfonso here. This is like Alfonso using the gift that God gave him to accomplish whatever it is that I've been set out to accomplish in this well, life. Well, with that kind of support and motivation, you can do anything. And that exactly. leads me to the final big question. What are your future dreams within this industry to go along with all you've already done? I'll tell you, like I've told everybody else, my dream and aspiration is to be as happy as possible every day. I cannot put a job title on my dreams and aspirations because I change my mind too frequently. <laughs> the only thing that I don't change my mind about is that I want to be as happy as possible every single day. I want to feel as free as possible every single day. When I am doing my job, when I am traveling, when I'm doing whatever it is I'm doing, life is too short to not be happy. And I've lost a lot of people over the past five years. And most recently back to November, I lost my cousin. And I'm like, life is too short. He was only 36. Life is too short. Like you have to do things that make you happy every single day because you never know. All of us have a time where we're gonna go. What can you do to maximize every single day so that you don't have any regrets that you live life to the fullest? That is my dream and aspiration in this industry. Whatever makes me happy, is what I'm going to go towards. And I'm not afraid to change my mind. I'm not afraid to suddenly pivot into a different direction. That's how Alfonso Speaks came to be. I just pivoted into a different direction. I just try new things. Whatever makes me happy in that moment, whatever gives me that feeling of joy is what I go to. Yeah, isn't that what it's all about? And that's not yeah. only good broadcasting advice, that's really good life advice. All For right, sure. we like to finish with what we call the dream sequence. I'll throw you three questions, rapid fire answer. Are you ready? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. You were a wrestler recently as you went after that dream for, for a period of time. Who would be your dream wrestling opponent? Shawn Michaels. Never going to happen. Got to go for the best, right? Never going to happen because he's one. too old, but Shawn Michaels. <laughs> well, that's where that's how you get him, right? You get him when he's old. Right. <laughs> Good. Uh, you obviously delved into a lot of podcasts who would be your dream podcast guest any kind of podcast Stephen a smith oh man that would be quite oh a conversation goodness. you too the clips you, that i could get from that <laughs> you could ask him about what he was doing up in the box with Derek jeter and michael jordan the other day at the and National travis League. scott like what yeah, was crazy. going on yeah. crazy all right finally uh you've done a lot of traveling done a lot of traveling with your family family vacation dream vacation oh man um 
gosh, I feel like we've already been there because we've gone to Italy. But I will say, um, I will say I've never been to Canada. And I would just be interested to see how a family vacation would go there because my wife can't stand the cold. And it would be hilarious <laughs> to see her there in Toronto. And like, you know, I don't know, even the fall time would be too much for her. Like, it, it would just be great. I would love to see so that. So not only go to Canada, go when it's cold just to see how she reacts. Exactly. All right. Maybe February. I'm I'm sure she appreciates that. <laughs> All right. Final thing. You already given some really good advice, but any final advice for young broadcasters, members of our program, alumni, anybody who's watching? Uh, you're the one who determines your worth. Don't let anybody determine that for you. Not a job, not even a spouse or a family member. You have to find inside yourself what your worth is and stand on that and carry that with you because that's what your legacy is going to end up being, which you determine it to be. And the more you let other people control that, the less control you have of your own legacy. And really, that's the only thing that we take with us when we're gone. We take what we've done here, what we've accomplished here, and how people remember us. Because people aren't going to remember what you did necessarily. They're going to remember how you made them feel. So make sure you're a good person all the time. Peace, love, and positivity, PLP, spread it everywhere you go and ensure that you are kind to the next person always. And you can live on forever that way. If you do something to help somebody and they help somebody and they all started with you, then you will live forever, right? With exactly. your good deeds. Lots of good deeds from my special guest today. I want to thank Alfonso McCree Jr. His story will continue and continue in a very strong fashion. He's living his dream. All of you keep on living yours.